All right, you received the email that has the outline for tonight. And what we're gonna do is remind ourselves, we're gonna watch this video from the Bible Project. Uh, and it's going to remind us a little bit of Genesis because what I wanna do for a few moments is just talk a little bit about how some of the main themes that you see in Genesis make their way into the historical books of the Old Testament. And we'll be using our Bible. And so if you have it available, um, we'll be turning to a few, not all. Uh, there's a number of references in that handout, but we'll be looking at a few of them. And, and we'll mostly be starting uh, in Exodus and then just kind of moving forward in the Old Testament, just looking at a few things here and there. Uh, this could be kind of a study in and of itself uh, if you were to really dig deep in a lot of the other literature of the Old Testament. Uh, it pops up in various ways, uh, but I'll just kind of give you a taste of how that works. But in order to uh, think a little bit about uh, what we have talked about in the book of Genesis, uh, there's a four-minute video, and since you're going to be able to hear the sound this time, uh, I think it'll help us as we launch into this last study. So here we go. We're walking through the book of Genesis, which is made up of these two main parts. And the first part begins in the garden, where we watch humanity spiral downward in self-destruction, and it ends in the Tower of Babel, where a rebellious humanity is scattered by God. Then the second part of Genesis zooms in and focuses on just one family. And right in the middle is this story that links the two parts of Genesis together and helps us understand what the whole book is all about. So how do we get from the Tower of Babel to the story here in the middle? Well, after the scattering at Babel, there's this genealogy, and it follows one of the tribes all the way down to this one guy named Abram. You probably know him as Abraham. And God starts making all these promises to Abraham, like he's going to bless him and give him a ton of kids. And he says that through him and his family, all the nations of the earth are now going to find God's blessing. So basically, God is trying to restore humanity back to the goodness of the garden and to his original intentions for the world. So it's like his rescue plan for humanity. And that's why the whole second half of Genesis is about this one family. And so you have, you have Abraham, and then he has a son, Isaac, who has Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons. And to each generation, God renews his promise to bless them and all nations through them. So because of this promise to use this family to rescue the world, it's pretty easy to read these stories as examples of how to be a good person. But actually, for the most part, this family is totally dysfunctional. So for example, let's go back to Abraham. This whole story is about God giving him and his wife Sarah a family, but two different times. He basically gives Sarah away to other men by denying that she's even his wife. And then Sarah gets impatient about having a son, and so she makes Abraham sleep with her servant girl, which then causes all of these other problems in the family. So they get really old, and you begin to think that there's no way they're going to have a kid of their own. But then, miraculously, they do. It's Isaac. And Isaac, he has two sons, Esau and Jacob, and it seems like things are going pretty good. But Jacob... The younger brother wants the family's inheritance, which belongs to Esau, the older brother. So he devises a plan where he's going to steal it from his father, Isaac, who at this point in the story is now old and blind. Which who does that horrible stealing from your blind father? Yeah, and then he just takes off. So Jacob goes on from there to have 12 sons, big family. But Jacob loves his 11th son, Joseph, way more than all the others. And so he gives him the special technicolor dream coat. And his brothers, because of this, come to hate him. So much so that they plan on killing him. But they don't. They instead just sell him as a slave down in Egypt. Now, while in Egypt, through this crazy series of events, Joseph goes from being in a prison cell to becoming the second in command there. And so later on, the, the whole Middle East falls into this food shortage. And Joseph's brothers, they come down to Egypt looking for food. And then when they get there, who should they find as the ruler of the whole land? It's Joseph, that guy they sold into slavery. But 
he actually saves them from starving to death. And so here you have it. These are the great grandchildren of Abraham who have done this heinous act to their brother, but God has transformed their evil into something good. And that's exactly what Joseph says here in the last paragraph of the entire book. He says, you guys planned all of this for evil, but God planned it for good to save people's lives. Now these words, they conclude the book because they actually summarize the message of the whole story so far. Humans keep choosing evil and we are thinking they're, they're screwing up God's plan, but he keeps turning their evil back into good. And somehow he's going to use this family to restore humanity back to the garden. So that's the book of Genesis, but we still don't know how exactly he's going to use this family to bring us back to the garden. Well, yeah, but this is just the first book. So that's what the rest of the Bible sets out to answer. Okay, so I thought that was a pretty good quick summary and helps with the visual uh, where uh, you can kind of visualize the personalities that are in the book and so forth. So um, this book doesn't stop in the last chapter uh, it has an influence, as that video told us, on into the other books of the Old Testament. And there are several themes that keep popping up in the middle of uh, these, what I call historical books, um, because the way the Old Testament is structured, uh, you have Genesis through Nehemiah, that they are basically historical narratives. I mean, the book of Leviticus is a law book, but it fits into a historical setting. Um, and then you have the poetical books, Psalms and Proverbs and Job and, and Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes. And then you have the prophets and you have the major prophets and you have the minor prophets. So you have 17 historical books, you have five poetical books, and then you have 17 prophetical books. And of course, the prophets fit into that historical narrative as well. So by calling them the historical books, even though there is a mixture of different types of literature uh, that you find in the first 17 books of the Old Testament, yet at the same time, it's all built upon this history that began in the book of Genesis. So I want you to notice right here, uh, Genesis is about the promise that is made to the patriarchs embraced mainly in three themes, uh, the blessing of, um, of receiving the covenant uh, as a chosen uh, group of people, the progeny that they're going to grow and multiply, they're going to become numerous, and that they're going to have a land that they will uh, be able to call their own. So these three uh, are very important themes that keep popping up in the upcoming books. So here's where I want you to see it. And again, this is just kind of illustrate um, how it works itself out. So if you have a Bible, turn to the book of Exodus. So we're done with Genesis, but the influence of Genesis uh, begins right away in the book of Genesis. I mean, in the book of uh, Exodus, rather. So if you look at Exodus chapter one, you'll notice that before we get into the big plot line of the people being enslaved to Egypt and that they would need to be delivered, you'll notice the book begins with the renaming of the 12 tribes. So you see here in verse one, it says, these are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob. And, the, and then it lists uh, the sons. And in verse five, it says, the descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all, Joseph was already in Egypt. So it's not a real big family. Um, uh, family reunions, uh, I don't know about the one that you're going to, uh, Brenda, on Sunday, how many people will be there, but 70 is not a whole lot of people, especially in light of the fact that there's 12 sons. And so this uh, family goes down to survive the famine but what happens when they get down there is they begin to multiply. Verse six says, now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. 
that reminds us back to Genesis chapters one and two, where the great um, vision was to be fruitful and multiply. This is almost the exact same word uh, that you see back in Genesis chapter one. So they grow and they multiply. Uh, we're not given a numerical counting at this point, uh, but it was, it, it was enough that it caught the attention uh, of the new Pharaoh. In verse eight, then a new king who did not know Joseph came to power in Egypt. And he said, verse nine, look, uh, the Israelites have become too numerous for us. So they're concerned about the fact that uh, this group of people could be a potential uh, military threat against the Egyptians. And so, uh, come, we must deal with them shrewdly, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. So, this new pharaoh arises uh, because uh, the family of Jacob is actually carrying out the creation mandate that we saw all the way back in Genesis chapter one. Does that make sense to everybody? So now in chapter two of Exodus, this covenant is reiterated. Um, verse 23 says, during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery. So in the meantime, we find out that they had been enslaved and actually they will be enslaved for 400 years and they cry out and their cry for help uh, because of their slavery went up to God. Verse 24, God heard their groaning and notice he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that was the theme that we saw so often in the book of Genesis, this covenant. And God keeps reiterating this promise uh, to the descendants. And um, verse 25 says, so God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. So if they are punished to the point of extinction or extreme depopulation, um, then what is the covenant? Is it still in effect? And, and so God's going to intervene and he will do so by calling Moses. And you notice that uh, in chapter three of Exodus where uh, Moses is called, but what I want you to notice is two verses in chapter three. Again, it kind of reiterates once again uh, the Genesis account. So as, as Moses is called uh, out uh, by God to this burning bush, um, it says in verse six, then God speaking to Moses says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So again, it's reiterating that covenant we saw in Genesis. And so what does that covenant entail? If you jump down to verse 8, it says, So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So this is bringing up all kinds of Genesis imagery where the land is promised to Abraham and his descendants. And, um, and again, it's, it, it, if you were to start the Bible at the beginning of Exodus rather than with Genesis, you wouldn't know this backstory and you would kind of scratch your head a little bit and say, what is it, what's going on here? I don't understand what it, he's talking about. But this is assuming that we understand that uh, the Genesis narrative uh, called out Abraham and gave to him promises. That makes sense to everyone. So the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Old Testament, Penta being five. And um, in those first five books of the Old Testament, uh, there is a reiteration of uh, the land and the promise of going into the land having a land of their own, and so forth. The only problem is, in the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the people are not faithful to the covenant. And, uh, of course, there's a supplementary covenant that's given in Exodus. It's given to Moses on top of Mount Sinai. 
but there are some blur uh, blessings and curses that are kind of associated with um, them keeping this uh, covenant. And, and that's what you find in the second giving of the law. And that's what the book of Deuteronomy is. So you have the first giving of the law in portions of it are in Exodus, but uh, the whole book of Leviticus expands upon that uh, covenant that was given on Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy is a second giving of the law, and I'm not going to turn to these uh, passages, but what you'll find in them is this ongoing repetition that if they will obey God, uh, they will have the blessing of the land. If they disobey God, then they will experience captivity, that they will be overrun by foreign oppressors, that type of thing. So this has already been said once before. It's just reiterated again in Deuteronomy because of what happens in the book of Numbers. And that is uh, the people... Uh, make their way out of Egypt. They go up. They're about to enter into the land. Uh, Twelve spies go out to spy out the land to see what they're up against. Ten uh, of those spies come back and say they're too big. They're too strong. They have too many weapons. We're not going to overtake them. Only two, Joshua and Caleb, come back and say, no, God's given us this promise. We should go on in. Well, what happens is the uh, people listen to uh, the majority report and that they turn back. And one of the things that they will do is wander in the wilderness uh, for about 38 years. And uh, we round up to 40 because ultimately they have been camped out for a while uh, it, at Mount Sinai where they receive the law and they're beginning to um, establish themselves as a newly formed nation. However, um, in that wandering, the generation that had been given those promises built upon the book of Genesis is uh, they die off. And so the next generation that's going to go in under the leadership of Joshua uh, needs to have the reiteration of the, of the, the law given. And so that's what the book of Deuteronomy does. It gives a second giving of the law. And if you read, and Deuteronomy is a lengthy book. If you read through the book of Deuteronomy, you'll say, I've read this before. And you did, because it was found in Exodus and it was found in uh, Leviticus and so forth. So, you know, Deuteronomy reiterates that all over again. So it too is built upon um, Genesis. But what is its concern? The book of Deuteronomy is primarily concerned about getting into the land. And so the land becomes the focus of, of the book of Deuteronomy. But it is built upon what I just told you in the book of Numbers, where uh, the people um, turn back and then they begin to accuse Moses of rather than bringing them into a land that's flowing with milk and honey, um, that he has brought them into the wilderness to die. And so they will turn on Moses and they want to uh, they want to kill him. And uh, what we find in the book of numbers, so you want you want to turn to your right again from Exodus, you're going to go past Leviticus because no one really wants to stay too long in the book of Leviticus. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> and you'll come to the book of Numbers. So come to chapter 16 of Numbers. And when you get there, this is on the heels of chapter 13, uh, where the spies are sent out and the people rebel in chapter 14. And then you get to chapter 16. And when you get there... Um, you find down in verse 13, um, this accusation that is brought out against Moses. Isn't it enough that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey? 
They're describing Egypt. Okay, you brought us out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the desert. So they have kind of flipped in their thinking. Um, many of them felt that it was better that they would have stayed in Egypt, that they would have been more prosperous in Egypt, and that they would have had more uh, resources available to them. And uh, one more place over in Deuteronomy, uh, not Deuteronomy, Numbers chapter 20. So if you just go to the right for a second. When you get to chapter 20, what you're going to find is um, God has a plan to pro make provision for these people that are wandering in the wilderness, the water and the manna and that type of thing. Uh, but here's the setup. In verse one, it says in the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. Uh, there, Miriam died and was buried. Now, there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, if only we had died when, when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this desert that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs or grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. So they would just as well go back to Egypt. But God is going to provide water um, from the rock, and that's the rest of chapter 20. And we know the story of the provision of manna because God wants to keep them moving ahead because he intends fully to fulfill that Abrahamic covenant that we were looking at in the book of Genesis. So um, it seems as though now, because the people are starting to rebel, that um, God is still committed to give these divine blessings to an unworthy people. And um, he keeps promising them rest. And you'll notice right here in the highlighted portion, uh, now we're going to come over to the book of Deuteronomy. So we'll go to the right uh, past numbers to Deuteronomy. And when you get to chapter 3, um, I want you to notice, I'm not going to read all these verses, but I want you to notice what keeps popping up uh, because... It's tied back to Genesis. When God had finished the creation week, he rested. And there is this expectation that when the people finally get into the land, they will be able to rest as well. So um, look at verse 18. It says here, um, I commanded you at that time, the Lord your God has given you this land to take possession of it. But all your able-bodied men armed for battle must cross over ahead of your brother Israelites. However, your wives, your children, and your livestock, I know you have much livestock, may stay in the towns I have given you until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they too have taken over the land that the Lord your God is giving them across the Jordan. So you'll notice that word rest. And it seems as though what was shared in the book of Genesis keeps being repeated. So you're in Deuteronomy chapter three, verse 20, go over to chapter 12 and verses nine and 10. I'll start verse eight. That's where the paragraph begins. It says, you are not to do as we do here today, everyone as he sees fit. Since you have not yet reached the, resting place. Do you, do you see the theme there again? The new land that was promised all the way back in Genesis was to be a place of what? Rest. And what do we mean by rest? Laying on your hammock? No, the idea of rest is absence of conflict. That is peace. They can experience peace. Um, and um, so, the land is very important, and it's all built on Genesis. Uh, you'll find in the book of Leviticus, we're not turning there, um, God gives certain types of commands that 
the people are to respect the land and not defile the land and allow the land to rest as well. So like every seventh year, they are not to uh, plant uh, crops. They're to allow certain fields uh, to rest so it can be rejuvenated. So you have a physical land that is resting and the people that are in that land are supposed to rest on it as well. Okay, do you have questions there? Again, the, all of this is kind of built on Genesis where God is the first one that rests after the uh, sixth day of creation. Second generation, because the generation has died off, but right. yet they are remembering Egypt as being a wonderful place. Yeah. From what their parents have taught. Yeah. And, and did you guys hear what Esty said? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're remembering, you know, how we reminisce. Um, and they're remembering the dates and the pomegranates and the, the, garlic. the garlic and the onions and all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, did they personally remember it or is it just built upon the stories that were told around the campfire by their parents, you know, while they were in the wilderness? That's probably what happened. Yeah. What was it when you were reading that uh, the only the men were supposed to go ahead and go into the land and the rest were supposed to be staying in the towns where they were? Well, the men were to go in and to conquer the land. So the women and the livestock were to stay behind until they took possession of the land. In other words, the women weren't going into war. To fight the battles the, the men were questions anybody else got questions okay that brings us to joshua trust me we're not going through every book of the old testament i'm just showing you little bits and pieces uh where uh this shows up so this uh creation week that ends in rest is interesting because it'll show up in the New Testament as well, in the book of Hebrews, this idea of God still wants to give his people rest. But it will take a while for the people to experience rest. And, um, and in the book of Joshua, you have Joshua taking over the leadership from Moses. As they move in across the Jordan River, one, one of the things that they begin to do is they begin to uh, take the land as it's portrayed here in Joshua. So um, you, what you have in the uh, book of Joshua is a number of battles are being recorded um, and they cross over uh, the Jordan, and the first place that they will come to is Jericho, and there's other things that are mentioned uh, after the fall of Jericho, which is in chapter 5. Uh, but if we fast forward uh, in the book of Joshua to chapter 21, so you have all these skirmishes that are taking place, and then you have the division land uh, for the 12 tribes, and when you get there, you have, in chapter 21, you have the listing of the tribes and, and where they're going to reside. That's where they're going to set up their community. But at the end, what you find is on the end of what I'm uh, it says this, so the Lord gave is Harry? Yeah. Can't hear you. You're going sorry. in and out. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. When I turned it to to let Esty be on the screen, I this must be a one directional microphone. So I I apologize. I, am I coming through okay now? Oh yeah. Now. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So uh, take a look at Joshua chapter twenty one and verse forty three. 
It says, so the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give to their forefathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. The Lord then gave them rest on every side, just as he sworn to their forefathers. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord handed all their enemies over to them. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Every one of them was fulfilled. What are those promises? Those are the promises that go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And you'll see two things here. The land and rest are repeated again in the book of Joshua. Thoughts there? Comments? What verse was that? Uh, Joshua 21, verses 43 through 45. You see the highlighted reference here, Beth? Okay. Well, somebody missed that in this Bible. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Are you in Joshua? Yeah. And I get to 33. Is the pages stuck together? No. Boy, I got ripped off and I didn't even know it. <laughs> That's the shorter version Bible, huh? You got the edited version. Yeah, I got the, the I don't know what version, because then it goes to 22. Well, maybe you have a page missing out of the I think, I think so or something. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Well, it's there. You'll have to look in a different Bible that you have. Yeah, I have to look in a different one. <laughs> and this is the one I like. It has the little tabs and it has explanations. Jeez. <laughs> Well, maybe they didn't have an explanation for that page, so they took it out. <laughs> I guess so. Well, do you have the book of Judges in your Bible? Yes, I do. Okay, so you, you go to, to the book of Judges. Now, the book of Judges is a fascinating book. Uh, it's a gory and bloody book. Um, uh, it, when they are in the land, uh, once again, the people begin to struggle for the territory that, the, uh, that they're in. Uh, they are no longer experiencing rest because the tagline in the book of Judges is every man did what was right in his own eyes. So it seems as though they fall away from this covenant um, commitment. And every time they do, there is a foreign uh, group of people that uh, take over parts of the land and they are under oppression for a while until God raises up a judge. Now, when you think of judge, don't think of a long robe and a gavel. Think of a military leader. Um, a judge is one that would lead the, um, the resistance against these people that uh, have uh, taken over. And so you know some of them, like uh, Samson and Gideon. I'm sure you've heard some of these names, but there's a long list of them in the book of Judges. But it is all trying to get back the territory that they have lost. And this is a, the book of Judges covers hundreds of years. And it's what we find, if you go to chapter 5 of the book of Judges, um, we're finally told that they, after there is, uh, let's hear it for a woman judge by the name of Deborah. She uh, is able to conquer their enemies. She leads them, and it's a, it's a fascinating story. But at the end of it, here's what we find in chapter 5, verse 31, the very last line of the chapter. It says, then the land had peace.
for 40 years. And it's the same idea as rest. Finally, um, the land is able to rest. And then not, I mean, as soon as the period is put in place in verse 31 of chapter 5, in chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. That's the story of the book of Judges. No, no rest, and then a judge delivers, and then there's rest for a while. The people don't learn their lesson about following other gods. There are oppressive tribes that then begin to take over portions and territories, and God will have to raise up another leader to keep that unbroken string of promises all the way back to Genesis, that they will have a land, and they will be able to continue to uh, build toward the future in the land that God had promised all the way back uh, in the book of Genesis. Any thoughts there? Any comments there? So during this time, when uh, the, uh, the time of the judges, there's a side story that's taking place. And it's the book of Ruth. And we did a morning series on the book of Ruth. Um, but what's interesting is that um, Abraham's first experience in the land of Canaan um, was not to uh, marvel at the abundance of milk and honey, uh, but because there was a famine in the land, he had to go to Egypt to get resources. That occurs uh, with Jacob, and now it occurs as well with a guy by the name of Elimelech, who has a wife by the name of Naomi. And though, so they go to a foreign territory, uh, the land of Moab, and it is their, uh, their two daughters uh, find uh, husbands. And um, what we find is that while they're in the land of Moab, uh, not only does Naomi's husband pass away, but also Na Naomi's two sons-in-law uh, pass away. Sons, sons uh, not sons, uh, sons. They find, yeah, thanks. I got off track there. Uh, they find wives in the land of Moab, Ruth being one of them. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, Esty. Um, and what now what takes place is the two sons, so she loses her husband, she loses her sons, and uh, this one daughter-in-law, Ruth, uh, chooses to go back from the land of Moab back to the land of Canaan um, with her. And what's most significant about this short little story is how it links to the promise all the way back in the book of Genesis again. So take a look here. Um, what's significant is they come back to that same land again, but there's also told in chapter four, verse 17, uh, that after Ruth marries a guy by the name of Boaz, they have a baby named Obed. Um, and that will be the, um, uh, the grandfather of David. And so uh, Ruth becomes the great grandmother of David. Again, that string of promises uh, that goes all the way back to Genesis that they will have an ongoing uh, lineage. Um, you know, so there's not much said in the book of Ruth about Genesis, but it hints at getting back to the land again and then the descendants of, of uh, the promise are found in, ultimately, David. Does that make sense? Okay, now you get this. This gets very dense at this point in the Old Testament because you have First and Second Samuel, you have First and Second Kings, you have First and Second Chronicles. And um, you can see some of the things that are here on the screen. 
what I want to, all I wanted to point out is these, all of these books are trying to establish the Davidic line, that uh, the Davidic uh, descendants will continue to sit on the throne as the kings of the nation of Israel. So if you look at the last point here, linkage between the covenant with David and the promises to Abraham um, are made through vocabulary, thematic equivalents, and the development of key theological concepts. God's call to Abraham promised him a great name. David and Abraham alone in the Old Testament received this promise. So if you were to look back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, that's where the first promise is that they will have a great name. But if you go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, this is another covenant. So remember that cutting of the covenants uh, goes all the way back to the book of Genesis where God makes a covenant with humanity after the flood and then makes a covenant with Abraham. And now um, there is what's called the Davidic covenant. And so God makes a promise to David that there will always be a descendant of his on the throne. So if you come uh, to uh, chapter 7, look at verse 8. It says here, now then tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all of your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of the earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Again, that idea of rest comes into play here. So uh, a Davidic descendant, a covenant, a land, uh, a people, and rest. All of these are themes that go all the way back to Genesis. Do you have some thoughts there? Seven, yeah. Verse nine. Isn't it in your text there? Oh. <laughs> okay, one more slide. So you'll find little traces of Genesis in First and Second Chronicles, also in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, and that finishes off the historical books. Um, the difference between these three or four books in our English Bible. Uh, Chronicles is one book in the Hebrew Old Testament. But anyways, um, uh, these are all post-exilic uh, books written after the people have come back from the land of being in Babylon. And it seems as though what Chronicles especially is trying to do is in light of the fact that the people have been um, exiled from their homeland for so many years, when they do get back into Jerusalem, who's going to make the claim to have the right to rule? And it seems as though First and Second Chronicles is retelling the story all over again to clarify that it is the sons of Jacob, and in particular, uh, the uh, Davidic covenant makes the tribe of Judah, the most prominent among all the brothers, and that there should be a continued ruler that comes out of uh, David's line. So I'm going to turn to one more passage of scripture, and then we'll be done. And that's in First Chronicles chapter 5. So if you go to the right after First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, you come to First uh, Chronicles. And if you come to chapter 5, this is interesting on how the chronicler tries to once again reestablish that Judah is the most important son of Jacob and that Judah's line ultimately produces David. So take a look at verse 1. It says, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. He was the firstborn 
But when he defiled his father's marriage bed, his rights as firstborn were given to the sons of Joseph, son of Israel, so he could not be listed in the genealogical record in accordance with his birthright. And though Judah was the strongest of his brothers and a ruler came from him, the rights of the firstborn belonged to Joseph. Um, and so what there seems to be a reestablishing of the favored Joseph and then Judah being the strongest of the tribes that produced uh, David. What's fascinating here, though, is, again, what we saw in Genesis. And that is not following the accepted tradition that the firstborn is the most important child that is born, deserving of double the inheritance. All through Genesis, the younger brothers keep usurping the position of the firstborn. So you have a little bit of Genesis that shows up here, and it is reestablished again for the future of Israel, who should have the right to rule. So, okay, that's all complicated, but my point is Genesis is a foundational book, and it keeps popping up. Uh, all through the Old Testament. And if you didn't have Genesis, you would not be able to really understand a lot of the flow of uh, the rest of the Old Testament uh, historical books, especially. So that's where I want to kind of finish off our study. Uh, do you have any lingering questions, uh, comments um, that we that you want to talk about for a minute or two? So again, these type of studies are the type that you don't get the first time through. It, it's those type of things that you begin to make connections when you've heard it several times over. And, um, and you're talking about the New Testament uh, before. Um, you'll find even references to uh, Genesis in some of the New Testament books as well. I'm thinking of one in particular where Paul says in the book of Romans that um, uh, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now that's an over-the-top description, but, but basically... It's talking about God chose the younger brother rather than the older brother to carry on his promises. So it, even when you read the New Testament, I think you'll find bits and pieces of Genesis um, uh, again popping up. So, okay, any any other thoughts that you have before we finish? Well, you have been amazing uh, in your forbearance of my study here because it's not easy. Uh, many of these things are difficult to get your hands around. So we'll try to do something that might be a little bit more uh, friendly, okay, in the next study. User-friendly. Yeah. So, dumb, yeah, dumb it down for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dumb it down for me, she says. But <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, the Bible we're... for dummies, Esty. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we'll we'll close off tonight for, uh, and then I'll let you know the date when we'll start a new study. I'll I'll send out an email to you, and and uh, after I pick something out, I'll send that out and to you, and then I'll pick a date and um, we'll start back in person uh, again. Uh, I kind of like seeing you face to face, but for the mm -hmm. summer months, I think I thought it was good to do it online and mm -hmm. you know, that type of thing. So we'll continue to do in person and then we'll record it and upload it like we did before. So if you miss something, you know, you can catch it later. So, all right, thanks everyone. And uh, we'll, We'll call it an evening and we'll see you on Sunday, okay? Okay.
Okay. Yeah, Saturday. We'll see you on Saturday. Okay, Saturday. take care. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Hey, Pastor. Bye. Yes. Hey, Pastor. What's that? Um, Monica, I was talking to Monica, and she said she saw First Christian Church up for sale. Yeah. And it, they're asking 500000 now, if they sell that, who gets the money? Um.